Okay, right here. Hi, Robert Perlman with CollectSpace.com. Uh, sort of a follow-up to that. Um, can you talk a little bit about the Dragon's uh, cargo? Does it have ballast to simulate the same type of weight it would have on a supply mission or additional instrumentation for you to collect on this flight? Um, and I have a follow-up. Thanks. You know what? I, uh, I'm going to be guessing here. I think we do have some ballast uh, on this flight, but I want to follow up. I don't want to. I don't want to lead you astray. We do. We do have uh, patches uh, in the in the Dragon. Um, let me let me follow up. I don't want to be wrong on that for you. Then in regards to recovery operations, um, can you just describe a little bit about how many ships you'll be deploying, what type of ships they are, where you're staging them, um, and if you hope to get uh, descent imagery, uh, are you going to have, are you going to hope to see parachute deploy or um, see it uh, lower to the ocean or just come upon it once it's already in the ocean? Thanks. That's a lot of detail, and not that I'm not willing to give it. I just don't know if I can give it accurately. Um, Alan, you may know more. We're leveraging both commercial and NASA assets. Alan will probably have more detailed information than I do. Uh, I believe we've got two boats on the East Coast, uh, one boat on the West Coast. Uh, we've got a couple of P-3 aircraft uh, that we want to cover telemetry of Dragon during reentry. Um, we'll be getting TDRS links as well for telemetry. Um, we're trying to get as much data as we can, obviously. Um, Alan, do you have any right. follow-up for that? Well, uh, SpaceX is completely responsible for the recovery and leasing the ships and all the recovery operations for the Dragon. But we, NASA, are uh, providing some Navy P-3 aircraft to uh, assist with imagery during the entry and uh, as well as some uh, uh, telemetry to make sure we, we uh, uh, get as much information as we can to uh, support this, this new phase of uh, this demonstration mission. Dan? Uh, yes, Dan Billow from WESH-TV. Can I kind of uh, clean up on the end of that question and then and ask one of my own? Uh, so w would we see any of that imagery live on the webcast, the, down, the descent? Uh, question and a follow-up here, if I may. Um, the um, it, well, w when would the first launch of astronauts be possible? And I know there are no contracts for this yet. So, under the best-case scenario, how how early could you? How soon could that be? Thirty two and a half to three years after uh, after a program is initiated is uh, is the earliest possible for astronauts for SpaceX. question is there is it a private public private slash public venture or is this launch all NASA's money all COTS money given that this uh, demonstration flight is executed under the COTS program it is most definitely a public private partnership uh, NASA's contributed uh, a total of 278 million uh, we've spent uh, well over 600 million uh, at SpaceX getting to this point so um, from my perspective, it was an incredible investment uh, by NASA. It seems to me it's got to be one of the highlighted success stories of a public-private partnership. Um, keep in mind, if we overrun this program, uh, we have to come up with the money through investment uh, to cover the costs, which is dramatically different from taxpayers funding cost-type contracts, whereas if the contractor overruns, taxpayers have to pay the overruns. It's not the case in this uh, for this program, and I think that's exactly why this program was set up that way, to limit the government's exposure. Yeah, just very quickly, if I may, that 278 is for this mission only. No, the 278 million is for the development, uh, as well as the demonstration flights under the COTS program. Thank you. You're right here in the front. Uh, Jim Siegel, Celebration Independent Newspaper. I have a question for Gwen. I was looking at the uh, press release. There's a, a, a statement by your CEO, Ilan, uh, that says um, uh, the, the program uh, will be or po make possible a return to the fast pace of progress that took place during the Apollo era. That suggests either the use of proven technology or more efficient processes or shortcuts or something. 
And I wondered if you'd give us some examples of some of the elements of the program that make that kind of uh, statement possible. Sure. I, I don't want to get into how other programs are slower than us. I'd rather talk about some milestones that we've hit that have just demonstrated to be faster. Um, for instance, building up uh, the pad at uh, Launch Complex 40. I believe we got the right of entry in October of 2007. Uh, we started construction, which means we had our plans approved uh, and demolition complete, I believe, in May of 2008. And we were ready to accept hardware uh, at the end of 2009. Uh, so very rapid development of uh, Launch Complex 40. Um, so th that's just a, one example of how uh, SpaceX has been able to, to do things very quickly. I, I don't think there's any single reason why we have. Um, the fact that we do operate in a commercial environment. Um, we don't have to do the Mother May I cycle with uh, a huge number of organizations. We basically have a set of performance requirements uh, that we have to hit specifically for COTS um, and uh, interfacing with the International Space Station. Those are firm specifications and requirements that we have to meet. How we meet them is up to us. So that cycle of permission and, 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 uh, uh, and uh, implementation based on permission is, is, is cut dramatically short. I don't like to hear the concept of cutting corners. Uh, I would never characterize it that way, although obviously folks have used that term before. Um, uh, for uh, Falcon 1 and Falcon 9, we did enormous amounts of ground testing. I don't know anyone that does static fires right now of first stages uh, or second stages. So not only we, do we acceptance test every component, we've qualified the vehicle as well. So we do acceptance tests of every component, we integrate them onto stages, and we acceptance test the stages. I don't think there's a vehicle flying that does that. So um, I bristle a little bit at the whole concept of cutting corners. Um, just because it's faster doesn't mean it's more risky. Mm -hmm. All right, uh, Ken Chang, New York Times. Uh, this is from Ms. Shotwell. Um, after the June flight, Elon suggested that the first demonstration flight would occur at the end of summer. So I was wondering if some of the um, issues with, with the, whether there were issues with the first flight that's like the role of the second stage that were more bigger than they first looked and whether you could talk about some of the um, technical challenges that SpaceX encountered and solved in getting ready for the demonstration flight. Sure. I think we have our FAA report, our closeout report from that flight out on the web. If not, we will get a summary out on the web. Um, the, uh, the, the delays from the late summer to now are primarily associated with creating, getting the Dragon spacecraft ready. Falcon 9 has been ready, well, except for obviously the issue we found this morning. Uh, Falcon 9 looked to be ready far sooner uh, than now. Um, we have a, Dragon is a very complicated spacecraft. Uh, it's a spacecraft that's designed to uh, uh, withstand the incredible heating and pressure loads during reentry. Uh, it's a very complex propulsion system. We've got eight monomethyl hydrazine and N204 uh, thrusters, which are dual redundant. We've got dual redundant drogue parachutes, dual redundant uh, mains, uh, a guidance navigation and control system uh, that is designed to keep us in a tight berthing box while the International Space Station arm picks us up. Uh, we've got new avionics, new lithium batteries. So it's a very complicated spacecraft, uh, and there's a lot of work to do. And it would be foolish for us to uh, launch that spacecraft sooner than it's ready to go. So uh, we're taking our time on this, and we're willing to take the hits. Okay, Irene, we're going to take one final question from you, and then we're going to close out. Thanks. Um, Irene Klotz uh, with Reuters. Um, Gwen, what, um, um, what assurance is there that if you lose control of the uh, Dragon while it's in orbit or on its way to orbit, that it would not um, threaten any populated areas? Uh, what would happen in that scenario if you lost control of it? And um, could you just talk a little bit about what you needed to demonstrate for the FAA to give you your waiver slash license, whatever you ended up getting, for permission to go ahead and fly this thing? Thanks. Sure. Um, I'm going to have to keep this at a high level because I don't necessarily know all the details. But uh, in order for the FAA to license this this launch, this mission, uh, they have to go through the detailed design uh, of the, both the Falcon 9 and Dragon, uh, analyze the trajectories, run their own risk assessments as to what uh, could happen if we lose control. Um, and that's how we 
uh, end up with, uh, with the license, the approval. Uh, the process is a, is a painstaking one. Uh, it's not like they take their word for what we tell them. They go in and they do their own independent analysis and say that uh, um, we meet the expected, uh, we meet the criteria uh, to receive an FAA license. What would happen if you lose control of Dragon? Um, I, I believe what would happen is if, if we lose control of Dragon when it's still attached, uh, we, we would tumble and break up. Um, what if, uh, during orbit. I'm sorry? It, while it's in orbit. So in, a, in other words, if you don't have a controlled reentry, what would happen with the uh, spacecraft? Uh, well, hopefully the Dragon will break up if we don't have a controlled reentry. All right, uh, Gwen, I'm going to uh, let you make some closing comments, and then we're going to close this out. Uh, I think we ended up covering all the points uh, that I wanted to as far as uh, some of the questions that came up. Um, but I did want to close with uh, a, a huge thanks uh, to NASA. SpaceX would not look like we do today uh, without the support, both the financial and the technical support that we've received from them. They've been a fantastic customer for us. Um, NASA's taken a lot of heat and criticism recently, and I, I just have to say that the relationship has been extraordinary. Uh, I think we've both learned a lot. Both, both teams have learned a lot, and uh, I just wanted to thank them. All right, Gwen, thank you very much. Everyone, please uh, watch for any updates that uh, will be issued by NASA and SpaceX in your notes to editors as far as what our plans will be for when the next launch attempt will be and what the plan will be for launch day. And that will conclude this briefing. Thank you very much.